David Pelly. Greetings. Nice to see you, Kevin. Well, well, well. Uh, we've met before uh, at shows here yeah. and there, whatever. But yeah, I got to say, I don't know much about you. I know about your books. I have your books. I've read about it. I've and I have yours, Kevin. So there you are. <laughs> isn't, isn't this COVID amazing? We, we get to yeah. <laughs> spend time together. <laughs> exactly. Man, that's amazing. Uh, so yeah, if you don't know who David Pelly is, uh, you will after this interview. Uh, he has done incredible things in his life. So I'm going to start off with the very first question. When, where, and who got you into this wilderness travel thing? I thought we were going to start by having a toast. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I do have, I mean, it's a good whiskey too. Yeah. Okay, so my whiskey of choice is Highland Park because I think of it as being John Ray's whiskey, right? Orkney. Yes, that, that's a very good whiskey. It's a very good whiskey. John Ray obviously was a man of uh, not only of distinction, but of good taste. And uh, so you, you can't go wrong by following his example, I would say. So, so I'm a Highland Park guy. However, I, I do need to, uh, to show you my other favorite. Uh, can you see that? What? <laughs> what is that? Contraband. It's, yeah, it's actually, it's actually rum. And that is the label. That's not my... Uh, <laughs> but today is highly fun. <laughs> That's hilarious. So, and here's yeah. to John Ray and uh, exploration, which uh, is done in a respectful and uh, culturally appropriate manner in the north. And and really, like um, again, all your materials on, on that. And um, you know, let's just skip to the whole thing about when you went north. It was a it, late '70s, it was 1977. You went on a canoe trip, uh, yeah. and. Not that, you know, well, it, it, it's true. Uh, canoe trips will change your life. But the canoe brought you there. But basically, you, you stayed there. And you kept visiting back and forth and uh, uh, mixed with the culture and everything else and done amazing stuff up there. Was it that canoe trip that changed it for you? Uh, well, it was my first introduction, for sure, as you say, 1977. Uh, that was on the back river. But, uh, you know, four of us, my brother and myself and two friends, and uh, we were, uh, w you know, we were all experienced Ontario canoeists looking for the greater wilderness and the greater adventure and so on. That's what was behind it. Um, but I would say we were pushed to our limits. I mean, the 70s, you know, equipment wasn't what it is today. And uh, our tents didn't stand up that well to the Arctic blast and, and so on. So by the end of that month, uh, month long trip, we were uncomfortable. We'd all lost 10 pounds and we, you know, we, we, we'd learned lessons the hard way. I would, I should add that I'm the only one of the four that ever went back North. The other three, that was it for them. They never, they never wanted to see the place again. Really? But I, uh, you know, even though we were uncomfortable and, and I would, you know, beyond our comfort level for sure. Uh, even though that is the case, I still, uh, it got in, under my skin. And uh, I immediately started looking for ways to go back, up, back up north. That's really what uh, kick-started my writing career. I got my first magazine assignment the next year, and it was to go north. Oh. And... Uh, and then, but but initially, of course, going north meant some kind of organized <laughs> pattern, right? I mean, it, uh, it was still very much a frontier, or almost beyond the frontier, to go to any communities. They'd only been, you know, people had only been off the land for about ten years at that point, so it wasn't easy. Uh, so really, my the next trip. The next big canoe trip was on the Kazan River in 1982. And that, I would say, is the one that fits your description of the, the one that kind of flipped over the, uh, the page to, to a, you know, a different life. Well, who gave you the inspiration to go north, uh, even for the first trip? Like, what, did you read something or did you go to a presentation about it? Or No. I mean, we had my brother and I had this thing about going to Pelly Lake <laughs> on, uh, you know, on, on the back river. 
that's a pretty silly reason to go on a canoe trip and it'd be a whole lot easier to go to the Yukon and drive to Pelly Crossing or, you know, or go to Saskatchewan and drive to Fort Pelly. So you know, that's sort of, that's just silliness really. Uh, you know, I, I was imbued, I guess, with a sense of adventure from my parents. You know, my mother was a very good canoeist and went to kids camp in the 1920s, you know, and canoe tripping when she was young. So I grew up with that around me. My dad, who was from, uh, from England, was a very good sailor, and he had me sailing at a very young age. And those two activities, sailing and canoeing, have been fundamental to my life all the way through. But the person that kind of formed my approach to the canoeing was Eric Morse. I met Eric in the, in the process of planning that 1977 trip. And he was very supportive and very helpful and, and lots of uh, good advice. As, as you would know, he, he himself had paddled on the Thelon River in the mid 60s, which was very, very early for recreational canoeing in the north right and i mean to, to talk about how early things were when we were, were on the back river in 1977 we were the seventh seventh the seventh group of white men to paddle down the back river george back being number one you know so it, it recreational canoeing had not taken off up there yet at, at all i mean a couple of our our heroes like george listy had you know they and and that crowd had been on the george had been on the kazan just before we were on the back. But anyway, uh, so Eric was, he, he was a bit of a, a, a mentor to me for sure. And we became good friends for the last 10 years of his life. We you know, I saw quite a bit of him and we, we, we communicated a lot. And he had, a, he had a habit of phoning me on Sunday afternoon at about four o'clock and saying, David, were you out for a ski this afternoon? <laughs> it was just sort of a he he was always setting the example for me he was a great guy and and he also was somebody who who married the notion of canoeing with the history of the land that you're traveling through and you know michael peak has talked about that with you i know and it's been at the root of much of my writing also so i got that bug i guess uh, from eric well, that's incredible. When you sent me some photos today, uh, I noticed the one with you and Eric. I was like, I was so jealous. <laughs> uh, I mean, uh, I remember growing up uh, at, with that book, almost like a Bible under my uh, arm. And, with the, uh, uh, the Freshwater Saga, First Trade, yeah. or First Trade News yeah. then and now. Yeah. Uh, the Freshwater Saga, yeah. Yeah. And which was actually published posthumously. It was finished by Pam uh, and published after Eric died, which is unfortunate. But I, but I was there during the, the writing of it and talked a lot about that with him. Um, no, he was, a, he was a wonderful guy. Yeah, I, uh, I, I greatly admired him and, and enjoyed his company. I was very lucky to, you know, to have that contact. I always characterized him as the Canadian version of Sigurd Olsen, uh, basically because Sigurd Olsen yeah. had... And they were friends, you know that. Yeah, right? yeah. And, how, and how they actually did that was really incredible. Uh, um, they, he, Sigurd actually wanted to meet Eric uh, on the portage to become friends so they can actually go and work together to to enlarge yeah. aquatic and boundary waters. So it was, it was amazing. Yeah. yeah. So uh, according to something I read about you, you were uh, an accidental author. You really didn't go out to write about the North and yet you got a lot of books out. <laughs> well, thank you. And, and, you know, several hundred magazine articles too, which is how I actually made my living as you would Perhaps you probably get a lot more royalty income than I've ever got, but because of the nature of your books, well done to you. No, uh, but you can't live on royalties, my friend. <laughs> um, but magazines in the eighties and nineties, you know, as a magazine writer in this country, you could you could uh, do quite well. I mean, you know, you're not going to get wealthy, but you could you could you could survive comfortably. Yeah. Can't I don't think you, I don't that is not the case anymore. I do not believe. No. Um, no. So I was I was fortunate that way. Yeah, well, it was a way of being up north. You know, when I wanted to actually move up uh, to Baker Lake, I had to have something to do. The, the school w accepted that I could be a substitute teacher for $50 a day. And I did a fair bit of that. And uh, other odd jobs here and there, you know, get the odd photography gig or something like that. And uh, I was the jury guard when, when court came to town, you know, things like that. So, but uh, the, 
but writing sustained me and I, it was early days to be writing about the north there weren't a lot of people doing that and uh, so i was fortunate in a fortunate position of being able to sell uh, material from the north all by canada post eh? there was no <laughs> there was no internet of course yeah because oh, yeah, you think about it uh, of all the books you, you've written um every single canoeist i know you know they have the kazan they have the the Thelon, they have uh, all the river canoeing books uh but I have a feeling that the, the more to your heart was the, the land, the culture, the people, and all the books you wrote about that, including your, your latest one, um, is more to your heart. Well, I think you're right. Um, I, I, I would say that uh, I would not characterize the Thelon or Old Way North as being, quote, canoeing books. You're right. Those are places where I canoed, one canoes, people have canoed, <laughs> the canoe is part of the history. Uh, but I've never written a book about my own canoe trip or, you know, there's, I just have never done that or about a place as a canoeing destination. I mean, there's, a, there's an appendix in the Thelon book, which has a little bit of how to, how to go there information. Uh, but my even that writing was more kind of biography of place, if I if I may say it that way. So it you know I kind of took Eric's notion of writing about the history as you travel uh, even further. I would say I did that in my very first book, which I'm sort of embarrassed about now, Expedition of the Back River. That was more about our trip and the history of that we were interacting with. I, I followed that pattern, which was Eric's pattern in, in that first book. I, I haven't done it again since it, it, it's, you know, I shifted along the continuum. So I was really just writing about the place. Does that but, make sense? Yeah, it does actually. Yeah. Actually, I like that book. Uh, I, um, the Ola Holzer book as well. Uh, I really enjoy it because I, I, I'm a, I'm a big fan of that history. Uh, yeah. Um, it's, it's a very interesting bit of history. Uh, I agree. Well, what brought that? To Downs mind? And, sorry, sorry. What, what, what brought that to mind? Did you, did you all of a sudden wake up one day and say, "I'm going to write a book about Overholzer"? No, I was actually commissioned uh, by the Minnesota Historical Society and the Overholzer Foundation jointly uh, to write that book for them. Uh, and this is sort of what—that's part of what I mean by uh, accidental author—is that all, uh, apart from the very first book, which I, you know, initiated myself. Every other book since has been initiated by somebody else. <laughs> and I've just said, yeah, sure, I'll do that. Uh, you know, the, the, the next significant book after Expedition was Kikaruptut, and it was Inuit artist uh, Anaktusi, Ruth Anaktusi Jolari-Alec, who said to me one day, you're, you're a writer. I was in Baker Lake, right, when I was living there. And she said, you're, you're a writer. Can you help me with a book? And I looked at her and said, maybe, what did you have in mind? I knew Ruth as the dishwasher at the hotel. You know, like, what are you talking about, Ruth? <laughs> it turns out, unbeknownst to me, I was pretty ignorant still at the time. She was already quite a famous artist and had, you know, lots and lots of items in the Baker Lake print collection from her original drawings. And she, she got up from the kitchen table where we were drinking tea and walked into her bedroom and came back out with a stack of drawings, you know, the great big format drawings that you know, we prints are on like this and plumped the stack down on the kitchen table and said, will that be enough for a book? <laughs> and, and that's how that, that book began and uh, entirely initiated by Ruth and really orchestrated by her because she took command of the process and uh, after we kind of worked out that, yes, this was going to happen, her, her procedure was she would uh, pick a drawing for, for today and she would put it on the kitchen table. She very often invited one or two elders uh, to, to come and join us. And uh, they would just talk as triggered by whatever her image was. So the drawings came first. These are not drawings that were done to illustrate the book. It was the other way around, which is pretty intriguing, right? Yeah. And in the process, she taught me how to do oral history collecting because I'd never done that. 
That's so incredible. you know, I have that huge debt to her, right? It's, uh, um, but that's an example. And each, I could go through the books. And in each case, uh, something happened which triggered the, the writing of the next book. In the case of the Thelon, it was because the government announced in 1989 that uh, that there were the, what they called the mineral review, and they were going to consider opening up the Thelon sanctuary to uh, mineral exploration. And a few of us who were by that point already pretty big fans of the Thelon Sanctuary uh, got up in arms. And at the center of that effort was Alex Hall, my, my very good friend, Alex Hall, who died a few years ago, as you know. Um, and he and I just said, we got to do something about this. We can't let this happen. And Alex went to work. I mean, he just, that guy was an, a, a crusader of remarkable uh, capacity. And he got all of his clients uh, to write letters to, to government and that sort of thing. And he said to me, you got to do a book about the Thelon and, uh, and we'll use it to, and, you know, to campaign. And I did. And that's the, yeah, you and I actually met when I was on my book tour for the, with the Thelon book. Yeah. And um, that campaign lasted from the announcement of the mineral review in 1989 until the late 90s. It was about 10 years that the, the status of the, of the Thelon Sanctuary was up in the air. And I think that Alex's effort and my little contribution made a difference. You know, if we, we the government sat up and, think, and thought. And above all, I remember this, it was a joint review committee made up of uh, Dene from Lutzelke and Inuit from Baker Lake. And somebody put in front of them the stack of letters that had been written. And one of the wise old Dene elders said, if the people down south care about this place this much, it's probably our responsibility to look after it. And I think that was the end of the government's uh, attempt to open it up to mineral review. And it's still the the almost the only little parcel of the uh, of the north that uh, has had no mineral exploration it, so as the north uh, changed up over well, the 40 years you've been there um how well, obviously it has changed so yeah, uh, uh, yeah how has it changed for first of all uh, we'll, we'll talk about the negative for sure how it's changed but has it changed for the positive at all sure absolutely I mean, the biggest change, obviously, is the, is the creation of Nunavut, uh, carved out of, well, the entire thing was NWT, right? Uh, and in the process of creating Nunavut, there was a, an agreement to cr create the Nunavut government, which is de facto Inuit-controlled government. It's public, but, you know, they, by dint of being the majority. Uh, so, you know, they are masters in their own house in that, in that regard. So that's a huge change. And it's, I would argue, it's a change for the better. It's, there, there's growing pains for sure. It's not perfect in Nunavut, far from it. And the place is, you know, it's undergoing growing pains and it will do for as long as I'm going to be around, but uh, it's definitely an, uh, an improvement. Uh, so that, that would be the biggest change. I mean, uh, we could talk about changes in Nunavut for a long time but yeah yeah, yeah well, so what, what what's the biggest fear that you have uh in the next uh decade uh, of, of that area for Nunavut in particular yeah, yeah. well I, I i there's a bit of a crisis on the horizon because the population is so young you know it's the, the highest birth rate in canada is Nunavut and i can't cite the numbers but uh the, uh, the, an amazing percentage of the people in Nunavut are youth. And one wonders what's going to occupy this large cohort uh, when they're young adults and, and middle-aged adults. Uh, you know, they, they're, there's only so many government jobs to go around. Yeah. So I think there is a bit of a crisis uh, ahead. It is a catchway too, right? I mean, um, 
because you know if they want jobs in that area, then resource extraction is going to have to. Well, I, I shouldn't say that, but the perception is that that that's the case, right? If they want jobs, so. Well, yeah, but it's one thing to be, uh, you know, a caretaker or a cook or uh, or a truck driver for a mine that is owned uh, in Australia. Uh, it, it that's that that's one scenario the other would be for Nunavut to develop its own mining industry where they're actually you know, totally in control of it so it's how it's done that matters as much as whether it's done let me say Kevin I want to shift over to the table I'm getting too hot here by the fire do you mind okay we have a, a 30 I, second break while I move yes I, I'm going to get another I, I, cause it's only like, like midday. I'm actually putting ice in my, my scotch. Don't, Fair enough. Don't anybody. Okay. We'll reconvene at a greater distance from this rather warm fire. Okay. <laughs> my dog's in the way. There we go. Move. Well, it, it is funny about talking about dogs. Uh, my, I, I just realized now that every time I go to get ice or, 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 or a refill for scotch, the dog gets a treat. So I gave her a treat and this dog is going to be a beast soon. <laughs> well, that, that's, that's the downside to the treat routine. Yeah, I, I'm familiar this, with this that. This COVID thing. Oh my Lord. So now look, you freaked everybody out. You're now no longer by the fire. You're somewhere else. And uh, lovely painting in the background. Well, we've got a, yeah, we've got a nice bit of, of the Arctic coast in the background. So that's, that's apropos. Oh my Lord. I got, I, you know, I got, I actually have a script here, which I've not followed at all. Um, well, that's right. Yeah, we went all off the. That's fine. That's that's fine. Everything. That's what a whiskey chat's all about. Uh, all right. Oh, that that book. Uh, Arctic. Uh, the the ones about the Karen. Uh, Karen's. Uh, uh, yeah. Arctic Karen notes. Yeah. What yeah. what did that? All, that's an incredible idea. Well, that came up. I had a little uh, non-revenue contract with the government of the NWT to extract the notes. The original notes from the two cairns. You know, I, I had been, I had been past those two cairns a number of times, and, and of course, I, you know, and through the eighties, I was in the archives in Yellowknife all the time, and so people, you know, it's a bit of a, lots of connections there, right? And so people in the archives knew about those notes, and at some point, I said, you know, really, they should be preserved. That, that you know, Eric Morse is the first uh, note in the, in the. Uh, Hanbury Cairn at Helms Falls. And I think George Listy was the first note in the Kazan Cairn at Kazan Falls. So that's th th these are kind of historical figures. So they agreed with me because the notes were, they were just in rusty old tin cans and they clearly were not gonna last much longer. So they gave me a, a contract, which was in effect authorization. Uh, they didn't pay me, they just, you know, it was a non-revenue contract to take all the notes away from the cairns because there are, they were archaeological material, which it, it's illegal to remove, right? So you have to have government approval to do so. And when they saw them, they were quite excited and they said, okay, we have to do something about this and uh, to, to preserve, not just to preserve the notes, but to celebrate the fact that we now have this collection. So a small group of us proposed that we put together that book, which you're referring to, Arctic Karen Notes. And, uh, and what you see is the result. I mean, it's one of two or three books that I've done where we didn't put anybody's name on the cover because it wasn't, I didn't want my name on it. It wasn't, it wasn't my doing. And we couldn't put all, all hundred people's names on the front cover, right? Uh, but it was kind of fun to do for sure. And I should add that uh, facsimiles of all the notes uh, were reproduced and waterproofed and are returned into the, so if you were to visit either of those cairns now, you would find uh, facsimile copies of the notes in waterproof conditions and in one of those ammo boxes that you can shut tight against the weather. Uh, and we put waterproof waterproof uh, books there with pencils so that new passers-by could add their own thoughts. And there have been lots, you know, since since then, of course, there's been a hundred people or more go by those those sites. So so the, the tradition continues. It's kind of fun. 
That's incredible. I remember you presenting that uh, at the uh, Wilderness Canoe Symposium many years ago. And, <laughs> That's uh, a long time ago. Yeah, yeah gosh. All right, I'm st sticking to my script, I swear. Um, all right, what, what, what particular time we did with that? Uh, um, okay, we talked about that. Oh, um, so your latest book, The uh, Ancestors Are Happy. Yes. So, um, I, again, I think I just have a feeling that you were like just bite of the bit to put this book together because it's all to well this is a COVID project right we were talking uh, earlier you and I about uh, what we did to occupy ourselves during the COVID time and uh, this had been you know stirring in the pot for for quite a while it is kind of the culmination of of my transition that we talked about you know arriving up north as this southern canoeist with a very southern perspective on, on on wilderness canoeing which is where I started for sure and I you know slowly over the years acquiring a very different perspective on the land with uh, with the Inuit and realizing that there's the, the, collectively they they have a very very different view of of the landscape I maybe this is a point where I can I can mention my first teacher in Baker Lake uh, who you know I wouldn't want uh, a presentation like this to go by without acknowledging his his role Menick was his name. And very soon after I arrived in town, he, I met his extended family. They became very close friends and to this day are, 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 are good friends. I'm in regular contact with them. But old Manic was the patriarch of that family. And he just me, called me Tegawak, which means my adopted child. And uh, it, up until he died. But uh, that first couple of years living in Baker Lake, he he's the one who took me out on the land, who started to change the way I viewed that landscape, that it was just a place where we could live and be comfortable and 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 eat from from the caribou that were all around us. And 
I would not have been able to survive in this environment that, you know, in January, February, at minus 40 when it's dark. <laughs> like, but with him, it was easy and fun and totally comfortable. So it's a dramatic way to change your, your perception. And I, I, I really do owe it to Manny. He taught me how to, how to survive. He taught me how to build an igloo and skin a caribou and all that kind of stuff. Right? So that process started in Baker Lake in the early 80s. And it just continued. The more I did this work with elders and listening to them talk about the land and, and spending time out on the land with other, uh, anyway, both my own age and elders, you realize that, or one realizes that it is it's home in the in the in the deepest sense possible for for them it's where their spirit resides and part of the reason for that is that this landscape is is compiled it's like a tapestry of all of their stories of, of the, everything every place is a story and all the stories are interwoven through this map, this map. It's, it's just a remarkable, you can't go anywhere with an Inuk out on the land without them telling you a story about that hill or that river or that rock or something. It's just all around them all the time. And it's an incredible perspective on the land. It affects the way they travel. It affects the way they perceive, physically perceive the land. Whereas you and I are used to looking at a topo map, right? And so we, we, we adopt a sort of aerial view of the land. That's how we think about it, I think. Would you agree? And, but for an Inuk, when they perceive the land, it's a travel route. It, it's, it's, it's almost a line. It's, they don't have this aerial view. I'm not saying they're incapable of it. I'm just saying it's not how they, the default view of the land. It's about the travel route. And along that travel route is a, a litany of story. Uh, so this, you know, this has taken over my way of thinking about, about the North and it's a, it's a cultural uh, perception. So that's um, to circle back around to your question. It, 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 it it is really why this book is so important to me because what this is is a collection of the stories that have been shared with me by Inuit over the years from the land. It's, it's about how that landscape is really home for them. What, what focused you on that, David? Like um, you, you think about it, it, you kept going north. Yes, to go canoeing and it's beautiful and far north wilderness rivers. But it was the people you, you fell in love with in the landscape. Um, and what drew you to, to do that? Because there's not a lot of people like you, David, that actually would, 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 would put the time and energy to do that. Well, I guess this circles back to one of your earlier questions. Uh, in 1982, with a, another group of friends, I paddled down the Kazan River. Uh, you know, it was a 52-day canoe trip from the Caswell Lake, the headwaters, all the way down to, to Baker Lake, the community. And the, the thing that makes the Kazan special is that it is in itself an immersion course in, in Inuit history. You, you know, we didn't meet a single Inuk until we got to Kazan Falls, which is almost the mouth of the river. So, you know, you basically can paddle that whole river without seeing anybody. But you cannot possibly paddle that river without being aware that you're that, that there are recent uh, inhabitants, uh, and and the evidence of that is all around you. And so all of us, all eight of us, I'm sure, by the time we got to Baker Lake, uh, were uh, just very very aware of of the cultural setting that we had been in. Certainly, I I was deeply affected by that. Now, the other seven people on that trip all left very quickly within a couple of days, of, as people do at the end of a canoe trip. You know, they have wives and girlfriends and jobs and things like that to come back down south for. Uh, I didn't. I stayed. And I stayed until the first blizzard in the middle of September 
when, you know, we got a little uncomfortable living in my tent. So I, I decided it was time to come back down south. But just before I left, uh, it was clear to myself and it was clear to the friends I had made while I was there. I'd already been out caribou hunting with, with Inuit friends by then. And it was clear to them that I was kind of you know, taken by the place. And I, a friend of mine, a new Inuit friend said to me, if you like it here now in September, you should come back in the spring. It's really nice then. And I looked at him and I said, if that's an invitation, I'll be here. And he said, absolutely. I'll, you're welcome to stay with us. So I did. I came back down south and I got my uh, myself together and, you know, acquired some winter gear and went back up early in the, in the next year and, and then stayed and uh, slowly began to this transition that we talked about of, you know, to uh, really immerse myself in, in the culture. And, you know, I, it's not a connection, this connection to the land, it's not, this is not something that I can ever share, but, but the, the Inuit informants who have kind of taught me have, have, they have, they've given me insights. They've allowed me to understand their way of, of, of seeing things. We, we are never going to acquire this, perspective uh, on the land ourselves and but, maybe but, that's why you keep coming back to them because if you can't do it you want to uh see people that that or, or live with people that actually do it, it's it, it's always been a huge treat to, to travel on the land with uh, with any i mean i've done lots and lots and lots of that but it's uh yeah it's a it's a real privilege i constantly have learned from it I know winter travel, spring travel, summer travel, all of it, it's all, it's all wonderful. So yeah, yeah, probably, yeah you're right. You're right. Yeah. And, and you're also, um, you're also part of it right now. You've been there for many, many years and you yep. give back to it. You give back to it. Cause tell us about the fun that you're, 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 you've been doing for the last few years. The ILEC Fund, established in 2015, has already sent nearly 100 Inuit youth on challenging outdoor adventures. Climbing mountains, paddling wild rivers, and sailing the open ocean. Opportunities like this give youth a chance to grow and achieve their potential. Growing up in a small town is really hard to get open and out there. At my age, most kids are out doing drugs, alcohol, getting pregnant, and everybody expected that from me. In 2017, my first Ayalik trip for 10 days, I built confidence in myself of staying in the wilderness on my own to see the world, see new things, and develop new skills. It brought a lot of happiness and joy to my life. Without that, I probably would have had my mindset on other things. It's the best thing I ever did because it's a next step in life. As you age, it's like you're leveling up in life. As you level up, you grow up. Be you and be successful in your own way. I take after hockey because my dad played. I love to do adventurous things and explore. And this program is giving me an opportunity to make the step like he did. Stay out of trouble, finish school, and find something that's useful in life. One of my dreams is to become an Olympic champion, first ever in Oak. You only got like one life, live it up. You, you're your own person, you know the truth about yourself. These youth are the future of Nunavut. Let's help make it brighter. I feel lighter, like, you know it's gonna be okay, you know, it's just life, life goes on. Yeah, well, um, the Ayalik Fund, uh, as as you know, we established it after our our son passed away very suddenly. He he died of uh, sudden cardiac arrhythmia uh, at age 19 and a half. Uh, and this is a boy that we adopted while Laurie and I were living in in Cambridge Bay, 
in Nunavut. And, uh, you know, we, it, growing up, he uh, clearly had benefited from our canoeing together. I mean, by, by the time Eric, his English name is Eric, his Inuit name is Isaac. Uh, by the time he was 12 years old, he had paddled on the, the Thelon, the Clark, the Elk, the Consul, the Simpson. Uh, really? A couple of yes, yeah, a couple, a couple of routes up on Victoria Island, so north of Cambridge Bay. I mean, most people, you know, there's, there's, all, there's not all that many people who've paddled in, in the Barren Lands more than a couple of times in their lives, right? He was 12 years old and he'd already been on, I don't know, six or seven uh, Barren Lands trips. And it, he, was a, he was a child of the land. I mean, he just, it was nowhere that he was happier or more comfortable than out there. It didn't matter what the weather did. It didn't matter to him at all. So he, it, it gave him a lot of confidence. And we, we knew, we knew that that was the, the, you know, where he had planted his roots in all of that outdoor experience. And so after he, he, uh, he left us, we thought, well, this is something we can do kind of in his name, but to help other Inuit youth, we can provide those kinds of experiences for other Inuit youth. And we established this fund. We had no idea it would take off the way it has or be as successful as it has. But over the last five years, uh, we have now sent more than a, a little over a hundred Inuit youth on some kind of challenging adventure program, usually two weeks long. And it's made, there's no question, it's made a huge difference to, uh, to, to a number of them. It's been a great summer so far. I don't, I don't even know if I'll have another summer like this. Oh, big time, big time, David. You've created magic. I, I, I've watched a couple of videos of the interviews with those, and I, I, I uh, uh, it's your field. Yeah, I deal with students too. And, and, oh, big smile, a big smile watching that. Amazing. Yeah. It makes it's very, it's very satisfying for us, of course. Uh, it makes us feel that uh, you know Eric's time on on Earth has made a difference. It, he actually, he he expressed a desire to do something like this for other Inuit kids. Wow. I mean, that's pretty amazing, right? At age 19, he said, I, I need to do something to help other Inuit kids. Yeah. Now, the, w the way he chose to do it is not my first choice. <laughs> but, um, you know, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's heartwarming to know that that's happening. And uh, yeah, I think it's important work and it will continue for, we, it's all on the basis of private donations. And, uh, People have been very, very generous, and and we are very confident that this is going to uh, to last for years. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, that's amazing. It's amazing, really uh, incredible. You you think back um, uh, over forty years ago when you went on your first trip on that river. Did did you foresee all this, or? Of course not. No. <laughs> None of us. No, there's no chance of that. I mean, it it really is true that when I first in, in that that first canoe trip, it was just a canoe trip adventure. I, you had nothing to do with Inuit culture or, or, or Inuit. And, and I mean, this whole business with uh, adopting Eric, uh, living in Cambridge, Bay, that wouldn't have happened if, if Laurie and I had not met. We, we met on the Thelon River, by the way. Yeah, I read that. That's incredible. I, and I, I, I got to say, so basically you were not the person that went to a Northern River just to put a check mark saying I did it. No, I, I thank you for that. I, I, I am not. <laughs> uh, I'm about the other, you know, the other end of the spectrum from the river baggers, I guess. At least I like to think it. Um, yeah, and we've gone back to, to, to the same place time and time again. I mean, Laurie and I 
have paddled on parts of the Thelon River on, I'm not sure, I've lost track, but probably seven or eight times we've we've done canoe trips on, on the Thelon River somewhere. And at least three of those with our, with our son. Um, so we love that place, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a special, it's a special environment. We were lucky we were there in the eighties and nineties when it really was an incredible wildlife sanctuary. Uh, to a large extent, the wildlife has moved out of the sanctuary now or disappeared altogether in the case of caribou. Uh, so how did I get onto that? I'm not sure, but uh, you know, they, they, that, the, yeah, the Northern travel, it was just a matter of where we were comfortable being. And it was, it was the same, it was for Lori and me and for, for our son, we, we were there, we were not ticking off rivers, that's for sure. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So, what's next? Like, do, do you have it all planned? As soon as you get your shots, you're you're out of here. And hey, I've got my first shot already. So did That's I. The advantage of being an old guy. Me too. Me too. I I, I got it because I'm old. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, and I didn't pass out at all. No, no. A little bit of sore arm. I I had the chill. I was glad I wasn't paddling the next day. It would have hurt to do this. I, I thought the same thing. <laughs> uh. Well, what's next? I mean, uh, you know, my focus in terms of my work day now is the management of the ILIC fund. And it is pretty close to a full-time job. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a big deal uh, organizing the programs for the kids and then recruiting, the, you know, coordinating with communities to get the kids. We've, we've got, even though it's COVID and we probably cannot bring uh, in a youth down south of 60 this summer, we've got 17 youth from five different communities going to Yellowknife to go on canoe trips out of, out of, out of Yellowknife this summer. So, you know, it, 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 that's, there's a, a lot of moving parts there. But anyway, so it, I'm just saying it, there's a management job and, uh, and Lori and I are both involved in that. And we also have a, an employee now who, uh, who helps with it. So it's, and when you say what's next, I'm not certain I, I won't be moving on from that. So I'm not going to lose, that is not going to go off my plate as long as I can walk and talk and put uh, coherent words together. I'm not sure about the next writing project. And like I said, I don't, I don't come up with them. They come to me. So I, I'll have to wait and see as far as that goes. That's interesting. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm, I'm jealous of that because during the first lockdown, uh, Margaret Atwood suggested that I, I just write more. I, I had writer's block beyond belief. Really? Oh. Yeah, I'm, I don't know. I'm okay, but uh, that's good. Enough. I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. Well, I, that goes back to your question about old way. Uh, no, sorry, no, about uh, the ancestors are happy, and it was even though it had been stewing in the pot for for a long time, it was the opportunity, if you like, that COVID delivered where I thought, okay, I'm not going anywhere this summer. All, I had three trips up north planned uh, in the course of the, you know, the spring and summer and uh, all three were canceled. And you, you know, it's like everybody else, you know, you really couldn't do anything. So I thought it, this is probably as good a time as any to, to start work on that, that book project. And, and here we are six months later. Yeah, I, you know, I, I, it's terrible to say, but I got to thank uh, COVID and the lockdowns for for these whiskey chats because that's what kept me sane. And yes. instead of writing, I was doing these chats. And uh, man, I, 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 I'm so glad that I interviewed uh, David. Uh, yeah. I, I, um, we met in the, in the past, going back and forth at shows and stuff of like that. And we talked about like, don't ever meet me at a show. I'm like squirrel, squirrel. <laughs> Right. Well, and none of us are very good when we're either about to perform or speak or you know present. Uh, or yeah. have just done so. <laughs> <laughs> well, cheers. Yes, cheers to you, Kevin. Great to chat. Let's do it again. All and, right. Uh, you take care. Stay safe. It's fantastic. And keep up the good work. And uh, say hello to the North Forest. Will do. All the best.